During the Second World War, over 4,000 members of the Polish Air Force were killed while serving in 14 RAF bomber and fighter squadrons. Given the huge risks that these people were taking, it is hardly surprising that they let their hair down when they finally landed back at base. The leader of Squadron 303, Jan Zumbach, who was based at RAF Northolt, which is just behind this monument, he alone shot down 13 German planes. His mother cried, all pilots are drunken madmen, when she heard about her son's career plans. And to be honest, she wasn't far from the truth. When it came to enjoying life, Polish pilots were unsurpassed in Britain. English women were overwhelmed by the Poles' good manners. They were gentlemen. They would buy flowers and they'd kiss a lady's hand. John Colville, Churchill's private secretary, described Polish pilots as the best of our allies. One British pilot said that unlike his fellow countrymen who simply flew where they were told, Polish pilots would hunt down the enemy. In war-torn London, there were lots of tales of their bravery. One such said that a Polish pilot would only open fire when he was near enough to see the whites of the enemy's eyes. who served with the RAF during the Second World War shot down 769 enemy aircraft, according to some historians. In the Battle of Britain alone, just 151 Polish pilots brought down 203 German planes. On the 4th of July 1943, General Władysław Sikorski, the Prime Minister of the Polish government in exile, was killed in a plane crash off the coast of Gibraltar. Well, this was a huge setback in the war effort because at the time of his death, under his command, he had 150,000 troops on the Western Front. He was also in charge of 350,000 soldiers of the Resistance Home Army who were based in the Nazi-occupied Polish territories. Well, his funeral mass was held here at Westminster Cathedral. One of the Polish soldiers who attended the funeral said, at 10 o'clock, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom arrived in an open car. Churchill was somber and it seemed to me worried. The enormous church was filled to the brim with official figures, representatives of the government, allies and British military officers. Well, the whole funeral lasted three days and the cortege route itself was almost 30 kilometers long. King George VI expressed his grief at the death of an ally. I was deeply shocked by General Sikorski's tragic death my people will fully share the Polish nation's sorrow in its grievous loss of a distinguished citizen and soldier who has rendered outstanding service not only to his own country, but to the common cause of the United Nations.
General Sikorski was buried at Newark Cemetery alongside Polish pilots. In his will, he requested that should his remains be transferred across the English Channel, it would only be to a free Poland. Well, his request was finally granted 50 years after his death, when Poland was granted independence in 1993. During the Second World War, Poles had, according to some sources, the fourth largest Allied army. Well, they didn't stop fighting after their defeat at the hands of the Germans in 1939. A year later, they fought in Norway and in France. They defended the skies at the Battle of Britain. They fought in Africa and in Italy. And they also liberated the Netherlands and Northern Germany. Well, let's not forget also their work behind the scenes. Nearly half of the information gathered by the British intelligence came from the Poles. Well, on the 8th of June in 1946, a victory parade was held for the Allied forces here along the Mall. If you have a look at the internet, it's possible to see moving colour pictures of the victory parade held here in London in 1946. On the 8th of June, 1946, the victory parade of the Allied forces took place here on the Mall. Only 25 representatives of Polish Fighter Squadron 303, distinguished in the Battle of Britain, were invited by the British authorities to participate in that event. However, Polish airmen refused to take part in the parade in a gesture of solidarity with those omitted infantry troops and naval forces. Britain did not want to exacerbate its relations with the Soviet Union, so an invitation to participate in the parade was sent to the command of the Polish People's Army, a communist military force subordinate to Moscow, which didn't even take part in the fighting on the Western Front. Also, from a purely statistical point of view, its contribution to the victory of the Allied forces was non-existent. It consisted of up to 30,000 soldiers. In comparison, the number of soldiers of the Home Army, commanded by the government in exile in London, reached about 380,000. The Second World War didn't bring Poland its long-wanted freedom, and the soldiers found themselves to be once again the victims of politics. It was only 60 years after the end of the war that 320 Polish veterans, representing all of the armed forces, were invited here for a victory parade. Institute and Sikorsky Museum was founded in May 1945. Initially, it was only meant to house the archives of the Polish government in exile, as well as a few items once belonging to General Sikorsky, the Polish Prime Minister, who died tragically in 1943. However, over time, the collection grew. This room is dedicated to General Maciek and the 1st Polish Armoured Division. Here in this photo we can actually see German soldiers surrendering to him. The General and his men fought in northern France, in Belgium, the Netherlands and in Germany, and they liberated towns and cities as they went. There is no doubt that the General was incredibly brave, but his short length of service with the British Army meant that he wasn't entitled to a pension. So, he ended his days working as a bartender in a pub owned by one of his former soldiers. In these rooms we learn about Polish regiments and their commanders. This 
This cabinet is dedicated to the 10th Mounted Rifles. In 1920, they fought the Red Army when Lenin wanted to push the revolution across to Western Europe. This is one of the regiments that stopped him in his tracks. In 1939, they fought to protect the city of Lvov from the Germans, but then when the Red Army attacked, they felt they couldn't win, so they descended, they crossed the border into Hungary. Now, in 1940, they fought to protect France. And then after D-Day, they fought in northern France, they fought in Belgium, they fought in the Netherlands, and they fought in Germany. These items, they don't just tell the story of one regiment, they represent every single Polish soldier. For many years after the war, the unofficial leader of the Polish immigration, General Anders, had his office here, where he received dozens of people every day and where he tried to help them adapt to living in exile. Albert Hall is one of the most famous concert halls in the world. Now, even though it was built in the second half of the 19th century to hold classical music concerts, mainstream artists have performed here, the likes of The Cream, The Beatles, Jimi Hendrix. Now, before the invasion of rock and roll, a unique concert took place here in honor of the Polish composer Chopin. Witold Małczyński was the pianist. The conductor and composer was Andrzej Panufnik. They were both from Poland. Their performance attracted a huge audience. The draw was amplified by the fact that Panufnik had just escaped from behind the Iron Curtain and was seeking asylum in the UK. He said he was no longer able to tolerate the socialist censorship of his work. In 1953, the Royal Albert Hall also housed the convention of the members of the Polish Ex-Combatants Association in Great Britain. The unwritten Code of Polish Emigration, in its preamble, defined the true meaning of emigration, its duration and its mode of action. It was to last until Poland was liberated from the communist occupation. Thus, Andrzej Panownik would not travel to his homeland until 1990. In 1991, he was knighted by the Queen. That same year, he died. General Władysław Anders lived on this road. Now, he was the leader of one of London's largest national minorities, the Poles. He was also one of the biggest enemies of the People's Republic of Poland. And during the 1960s, he was under intense surveillance by the communist regime. In top secret files, codenamed the War Chief, we learn a lot about him. For example, he liked watching television. He read Russian newspapers like Pravda and Izvestia. And he was also a bit of a night owl. He didn't go to bed until two in the morning. This is a photo taken of the general in his full uniform at the end of the Second World War. And here he is again, this time with his wife and daughter, in his front room here on Brondensbury Park. General Władysław Anders was the man behind the victory at the Battle of Monte Cassino in May 1944. It enabled the Allied forces to then advance onto Rome. He was begrudgingly described by Poland's communist rulers 
As an able orator with a sense of mission and passion, politically uncompromising, he continues to evoke awe and respect among his former subordinates. The veteran circles loyal to Anders are the most reactionary and best organized group within the Polish diaspora. While Anders earned the reputation of a modern Moses because, like the great Jewish prophet, he led 114,000 Poles out of captivity and in doing so, saved their lives. After the German invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941, the Polish government in exile in London signed an agreement with Stalin, thereby founding the Polish army in the East. A year later, due to a lack of sufficient supplies, harassment from the Soviets, and eventually the breakdown of diplomatic relations between the USSR and the Polish government in exile, Anders made the decision to evacuate the Polish army from the territory of the Soviet Union towards the Middle East. General Anders' soldiers fought on the Italian peninsula, where they were one of the main Allied forces to liberate Italy. After the war ended, less than 10% of the general soldiers decided to return back to communist Poland. In the spring of 1940, 22,000 Poles were murdered on Stalin's orders. Half of them were officers in the Polish armed forces and the Polish police force. The rest were doctors, lawyers, teachers, all members of Poland's intelligentsia. Two years later, the mass graves were discovered in Katyn, and finally, in 1976, this monument was erected here in Gunnersbury Cemetery in West London. This is the first monument in the world to commemorate those who died in 1940. At the unveiling of this monument, Winston Churchill's grandson said that my grandfather always believed it was the Russians who were responsible for the massacre at Katyn, but it wasn't until 50 years after the crime that the Russians finally admitted their guilt. Now lying just in front of this monument to Katyn is Kazimierz Sabat, Poland's penultimate president in exile. He died on the 19th of July, 1989. He died while walking in the street. Some say he simply collapsed through to heat exhaustion. He had heart failure. Others point to the significance of the date of his death. Poland at the time was going through huge political upheaval. And just a few hours earlier, General Wojciech Jaruzelski was elected president of the People's Republic of Poland. after the Second World War, many Poles abroad were convinced that a Third World War was imminent and they were ready to pick up their arms again because they felt this was the only way they could free Poland from communist rule. However, as the Cold War maintained the status quo, their fears of having to fight again faded away. So too did their hopes of a free Poland. However, the one institution that gave them hope was the church. Coming here gave them a sense of identity. Coming here was also an act 
act of defiance because of course religion was banned by the USSR. So it's not surprising that this church in West London, St Andrew Babolas, was fondly called the garrison because coming here, Poles felt protected. St. Andrew Bobola Church has stained glass windows which tell the story of the Polish soldiers fighting on the Western Front of World War II. One of them shows the Polish 1st Armoured Division under the command of General Maciek, which became famous for its activities in the north of France in the summer of 1944. Subsequently, General Maciek's division took part in the liberation of Belgium and the Netherlands from the German occupation and earned the love and respect of both countries. General Maciek himself received honorary citizenship of the Netherlands. At this altar, a few items are displayed that were recovered from cutting where 22,000 Poles were murdered on Stalin's orders. And this icon of the Holy Mary was carved by a Polish prisoner of war who was interned at the Kozielsk POW camp. Here at this church, Poland's troubled past caught up with recent tragic events. On his way to mark the 60th anniversary of cutting in Western Russia, the Polish president Lech Kaczynski was killed in a plane crash. On board were nearly 100 people, including Reverend Canon Bronisław Gostomski, the much-loved parish priest here. Now, even though the Nazis were defeated, for the 250,000 Poles who fought valiantly during the Second World War on the Western Front, well, they felt that they had lost. They were unable to return home because the Iron Curtain divided up Europe. They thought the only way they could go back is to fight again in a Third World War. That is how much they longed for a free Poland. Highgate Cemetery is a serene setting which dates back to the first half of the 19th century. Here, where nature envelops the tombstones, over 170,000 people are buried. And it's here that you will find White Eagle Hill. It's where the Polish freedom fighters are buried who fought in the November uprising of 1830 to 1831. And it's here where lies Ludwig Oborski, whose eventful life could be the basis of many a film. He was born a few years before Poland was wiped off the map in the late 18th century. Its lands divided up between Russia, Austria and Prussia. He fought against those three powers in Napoleon Bonaparte's army because he believed that France was Poland's only hope of regaining independence. Unfortunately, his hopes were unfulfilled. In 1830, the Russian Tsar's troops mutinied against him, demanding that he recognize Poland as an independent state. Among them was Colonel Laborski. After the uprising failed, he fled to France. In 1848, he fought in Frankfurt and Northern Italy as a revolutionary. In 1848, he returned to Poland. A year later, Oborski, now aged 60, took part in the uprising in Baden. Oborski, like the rest of his brothers in arms buried on the White Hill Eagle, came to Britain from France for it was on the continent that the beating heart of the Polish immigration could be found. After the November uprising, several thousand Poles escaped Russian persecution by seeking refuge in France. For Poland and its countrymen, the concept of fighting abroad for a free, united homeland dates back beyond the Second World War. Poles were fighting for an independent country as early as the first half of the 19th century.